Okay, it looks like, <clears throat> pardon me, <laughs> it looks like we're live here uh, for the RTI post-game reaction show. So if you're watching this as a replay, um, it'll be a little bit before I have a lot of the actions. I'm going to fast forward just uh, a couple minutes here because I'm going to get all of the links and stuff posted to all the social media so I get some people here live. So if you're watching this um, recorded, just skip ahead just a little bit um, for the actual action. But thank you to all of you who are already uh, kind of following in here and tuning in. Appreciate that a whole lot. So get this link posted and we'll get right underway. All right, Tennessee. Big day for Tennessee in both football and basketball. They get big wins in both sports. The football team comes out and beats Vanderbilt. Finally, first time in what feels like forever, first time since 2016, Tennessee gets the win against Vandy in football, 28-10. Uh, to 10. They beat the Vanderbilt Commodores in Knoxville, in Neyland Stadium. Uh, a, a good win for Tennessee there. Basketball, Tennessee gets the game-winning shot from Lamonte Turner, the game-winning three to beat VCU down in uh, Florida, which that game didn't get watched by anybody hardly because it was on a horrible, horrible um, stream. But big day for Tennessee sports in general. I will talk about all that here shortly. With you guys, thank you all for tuning in to the RTI post-game reaction show. I appreciate it uh, very, very much here. I am Nathaniel Rutherford, the managing editor of RockyTopInsider.com. Senior day was dominated by a freshman. Eric Gray had a, a, a phenomenal game. 200 46 yards rushing it is the most by a true freshman in Tennessee history. It is the, I think it was the fifth most ever by a, by a Tennessee of all. So just such a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, day by Tennessee running back Eric Gray. All right. Got links posted. Should be good to go here. Let's get into the meat of this thing. Thank you all for tuning in here. Tennessee gets a 28, 10 victory over Vanderbilt. As I mentioned, Eric Gray dominating 246 rushing yards, 25 attempts, three touchdowns, uh, easily a career day for him. He came into the game with 207 rushing yards on the season, finished today with 246 in this one game, had a 94-yard run, which is the second longest in school history in a, in a single run, the most rushing yards by a true freshman in a single game, the fifth most rushing yards by a Vol period of, of no matter what year. Uh, only three other balls have actually run for more yards than Eric Gray in a single game. Chuck Webb uh, obviously holds the record. He's also got the number two spot on the record books for uh, Tennessee running backs. You also have Tony Thompson and Johnny Jones. Those are the only other three running backs who've ever run for more yards in a single game than what Eric Gray did tonight. Phenomenal performance by him. You know, people are going to probably say, where was he the whole season? I'll get to that in a second because I'm sure once more people start filing in here for the live show, I'm sure someone will ask that question. If you're here watching the show, feel free to leave comments uh, below or comments in the chat because where it's showing up for you on your phone, your laptop, leave comments um, in the chat here. We appreciate that very much. Interact with me here. We'll be here for a little bit tonight. Probably go for about an hour or so just depending on um, how interactive you guys are. Please leave a like on the video if you can. That'd be fantastic. If you're not subscribed to our channel, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. That would also be fantastic, and I would appreciate that very much. Tennessee finally beats Vandy, ends the season on a five-game winning streak with a chance for, you know, a six-game here in the bowl game. Seven and five after starting one and four. That turnaround is just incredible. I predicted seven and five for Tennessee to begin the season. Uh, not how I pictured it going uh, for the Vols. Not, not how I pictured the seven and five going for Tennessee. But you take it when you get it. Um, take it how you can get it too. What a what a performance by this team down the stretch. Granted, yes, um, competition got quite a bit easier. 
um, as, as, as the season went along. Well, not that it was, I don't think there was as big a drop as, as people are going to try to make it sound like for Tennessee um, down the stretch here, but I wouldn't, we can get into that in a moment. But Tennessee tonight, it, it was absolutely brutal start um, by Jarrett Garantano, by the Tennessee just team in general in this game. You had uh, the opening possession, wasn't doing anything, and then Garantano throws the pick there on his second pass of the game on the third play of the game. Uh, Vanderbilt intercepts that they get an easy and field goal range, get an easy three points to start the game for them. Uh, go up three nothing. Tennessee still couldn't do anything on offense for a while. Garantino was actually 0 of seven to start the game, and then finally Tennessee. You know, I don't I don't blame him for trying to air that a little bit because uh, because I mean you had so much success throwing the ball over the last couple of weeks. And I don't blame them for trying to throw it to begin. They turned the running game at the right time, and obviously both Tim Jordan and Eric Gray. Jordan found some running room. He, he didn't get to do a whole lot. But obviously Eric Gray was just a hot hand, and, and Tennessee made the right choice in riding him the rest of the game. He had that 54-yard run or 56-yard run, excuse me, to get the scoring going. Was it 55? It was 56-yard uh, run to get the scoring going for Tennessee. And then Garantano fouled Anderson for a six-yard touchdown pass, and then Gray ripped off that 94-yard run to put Tennessee up. 21 to three. They never looked back after that. Uh, they went 28 to 10. Defense, I thought, played uh, pretty well. Overall, not their best performance, but definitely not bad. They, they held Bandy to under 300 yards of offense, which, granted, they should. This Vanderbilt offense is horrible. But 279 yards of offense, Vandy only averaged 4.2 yards per play. Vandy only averaged 3.7 yards per rush, which is you know pretty good, too. Um, Riley Neal did end up throwing a touchdown, and that was that was more uh, just it was a well placed ball and a perfect catch by Kalida Lipscomb. I mean that that was I don't know how that wasn't intercepted. I thought when I first saw it that it was picked off. Um, that was impressive. That that that, that touchdown catch, I, I would definitely give um, give Lipscomb that give Vanderbilt that, but. Biggest takeaways from this game are Tennessee didn't play great. Obviously, the Vanderbilt was just they're a bad team, so they, they were they were able to get away with it and kind of um, you know play sloppy and still win. Nine penalties for sixty six yards. So Vandy had nine penalties for seventy six yards in this game too. Tennessee did get three sacks, five tackles for loss. They didn't allow a sack, which was also impressive. Um, I know obviously only seventeen dropbacks or seventeen attempted passes by Garantano, so not a, to- a whole lot of opportunities for Vanderbilt to get. Um, you know, any sacks, but no sacks on 17 pass uh, pass attempts. Only three tackles for loss that Tennessee allowed, so it showed that the offensive line was doing a good job consistently. It wasn't just a couple big runs. They're doing a good job consistently pushing forward and not allowing a lot of negative plays. Tennessee, I mean, they they, they played poorly and still kind of pretty much dominated this game. It, yes, Vanderbilt got that score late to make it 21-10, but then Tennessee went back and um, responded and got – another touchdown with another Eric Gray run to give him three on the night. What a, what a game, what a, what an ending to this season for Tennessee um, for the whole football team. Like I said, start out one and four. We can talk about, we can talk about some basketball here in a second too. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that because Tennessee, you know, had a, a phenomenal win down in uh, a nice field in Emerald Coast Classic, but Tennessee goes out and, I was, I wouldn't say worried, but I, I was sitting there thinking, okay, great. This is this is not how Tennessee wanted to end the season here. I fully expected the whole time Tennessee to win it. I never thought Vandy was going to win. I just wondered, is this going to end up being a, a closer game than we're expecting? Is this going to be like the uh, think back to the 2014 game where Tennessee just had to t- you know fight and claw their way to a victory in that one? But thankfully, for Vol fans and people and us media members covering it. It ended up turning into, you know, I don't know that it was a flat out blowout. Maybe it wasn't what Vol fans were expecting, but the weather also played into that some. Uh, the weather was awful. Delayed the game by 30 minutes to start, and then you had a delay there in the fourth quarter when there's like seven minutes left, and that was just pointless and awful. Um, I, I, if y'all were there at the game, I'd be curious to hear, hear your thoughts and, you know, see your comments and stuff from you know, what your experience was like in Neyland Stadium because – I don't think it was obviously the, to the same degree as the LSU game in 2017, where that was just a, a, a downpour and looked look like a, uh, a monsoon. But it didn't look like that was a very fun game 
at the same time uh, to be sitting in and to be um, in the stands of. But kudos to Tennessee fans. They they almost got 90,000 there for the game, even with the really bad weather they had um, in Knoxville and, and Newland Stadium. So kudos to – if you went to the game, kudos to you for showing up and showing out and being loud despite um, – the really bad weather, and I, I thought the seniors still got a good ovation and, and good uh, pregame stuff by the fans, even though um, fans were told, I think, shortly after that, I think it was right after that, to go clear out, and they cleared out Neyland, um temporarily as they uh, waited for the storms and stuff to pass through. So hopefully you guys still had a fun time there, even though it wasn't, wasn't a fantastic game. It wasn't what you, I guess, maybe were hoping to see. A lot of people were probably hoping to see Tennessee drop 40, 50 points on Vanderbilt. But still, 28 to 10, uh, Tennessee's first victory over Vandy since 20. I said 2016. That's wrong. 2015. Yeah. Since 2015. Um, Tennessee's first victory since 2015 over Vandy. The biggest margin of victory against Vanderbilt since that same win. Tennessee got, uh, they beat Vandy 53 to 28 that game. So that was a 25 point victory. If I did that math correctly off the top of my head, I believe so. 25 point victory. This one, an 18 point victory. Um, so both Tennessee's most recent victories over Vanderbilt have been blowouts. It didn't cover the spread, um, but I, I, it doesn't shock me a ton that Tennessee didn't cover the spread there. But Lane Pine, first and only comment so far here uh, on the live show, said Eric Gray. Touch on Eric Gray already. So leave some comments here if you're watching this. Uh, feel free to, to leave some comments here in the chat so I can have um, some more stuff to interact with you guys. Read some more stats. Uh, Dominic Wood Anderson got his first touchdown of the season tonight. Three catches, 45 yards, and a touchdown. Juwan Jennings, two catches for 55 yards. He had that 50-yard uh, catch and run where I, I was really hoping he would be able to score on that play. I think my my biggest disappointment from tonight was that um, you didn't get more seniors involved. Obviously, Eric Gray um, had a phenomenal game. You got you got to keep giving him the ball um, because he could not be stopped. But I wanted to see Jennings and Callaway get touchdowns. Neither of those two did. Did see Dominic Wood Anderson get a touchdown, which, you know, he's a senior, so happy for him to do that and see that. Uh, Tennessee was led by a senior on defense with Daniel Batuli getting eight tackles. Um, trying to see Nigel Warrior finish with four. So you, you had some of the seniors, you know, make some good plays and, and, and do things that um, was nice to see on senior day. But I wish I wish we could have seen – uh, yeah, and I think, Ethan, as you said, I think it was more because of the poor weather that Jennings didn't get um, maybe as big of a game as, as everyone was kind of hoping. Um, Tennessee take, what did you see on the skirmish from the sideline with JJ? I don't know. I, I saw I saw Phil mentioning that he pulled a, a quote-unquote, pulled a Hainsworth, that he accidentally he stepped on a guy, um, his head. I From what I saw, people were saying he didn't look like he did it on purpose, look like he was not looking down when he did it and stepped on the guy. I, I, I need to go back and watch the replay. When I was watching it here, um, the audio feed blew up on the SEC Network Ultimate channel, and then the video feed temporarily blew up. So it, it was confusing. Um, I did see that he had a late hit, obviously, threw the guy to the ground and was out of bounds. I was not a good look by Jawan. No, not at all. No, I don't condone it. But at the same time, I understand it, too, from where Jawan is and being from Middle Tennessee and stuff. I, I'm not condoning it. Like I said, he should have done it. I, I would have preferred he didn't do it. Um, it, I don't think it was a good look for him, but I don't think it means he's a bad kid or that he's, you know, that's a, it's a poor representation that university of Tennessee is trash or anything like that. That game was chippy. I said early on in that game in the first half that I, I said, you know, I think there's going to be a fight, um, that happens in this game. What wrong on that one? Um, they, they ended up, you know, getting into a scuffle there, a skirmish, I think, as you called it, uh, Tennessee take, but, uh, uh, maybe I'm being, I may, I need to go back and watch it before I can really give, too harsh of a criticism to, of Juwan or be too linear or whatever. I, I need to go back and rewatch that before I um, make too much of a judgment on Juwan for whatever happened there. Because I know for a fact, you know, early on in the game, Kevon Bennett had that late hit on the punt return for Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt had a late hit um, on sportsmanlike conduct later in the game too. So it was just a chippy game. Both of those teams absolutely hate each other. Um, I don't know. It's not the team Tennessee hates the most. It's just Tennessee hates them because they shouldn't have lost them the way they have over the last three years. So it's kind of more of a, a frustration and a hatred rather than, you know, like a, a hatred between Tennessee and Florida or Tennessee and, and Al- Alabama. It's not to those that degree, and it never will be because Vanderbilt should historically be and it has been has historically been, you know, little brother to Tennessee. Uh, but these two teams definitely don't like each other, uh, you know, especially Juwan being from middle Tennessee 
uh, close to Nashville over there in, in Murfreesboro and played for Blackman. Um, he hears a lot about it, I'm sure. Uh, Dustin Binkley, <coughs> excuse me, Dustin Binkley said, what bowl game do you think Tennessee will go to? That's a good question. I still think it's going to be the Gator Bowl down in Jacksonville. Um, part of me is hoping it's the Outback Bowl just because I like the Outback Bowl more. Um, but I, I, I think it's still going to end up being the Gator Bowl. Even I, I haven't had a chance to, to you know, look at what all has happened with um, all the SEC games, kind of how that's going to play out and, and affect everything. I think Florida, Florida State, they're still playing right now, but I don't know what the score is. Let me let me pull that up really quick here. I bet you Florida's rolling them. Yep. Uh, <laughs> halftime, Florida leads 30-7 to seven over FSU. So, ooh, not looking good for Florida State there, which I didn't expect that to happen. But I, I think it's probably going to be the Gator Bowl uh, for Tennessee. I think Outback Bowl with, with a chance there. I'm more curious to see who Tennessee plays because Michigan just got absolutely just curb stomped by, by Ohio State. Um, does that make them – how far does it make them drop in the polls? Because they're currently number – 10 uh, they might be i don't think they'll drop out of the top 25 but they might be barely 20 or somewhere around there i i wonder if that's enough to make them fall into a category of playing tennessee i would love 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 to see tennessee play michigan uh to see the balls play jim harbaugh and just see tennessee play michigan in period in football because that doesn't happen often it's happened one time period ever um for the balls and, and michigan to play so let me tweet out another link here asking uh, where do you want to see the balls in a bowl game? Do you want to see UT play? Okay. So where do you want to see the balls in a bowl game? Who do you want to see UT play? That's going to be our next topic of discussion here on the post game show of Tennessee getting a much needed victory um, over the in state little brother. Vanderbilt Commodores in this game, 28 to 10. Like I said, I think it's going to be the Gator Bowl. Um, it wouldn't shock me if it was another one, if it was the Outback or if it was even some other game, uh, some other bowl game. But I think in Gator Bowl for Tennessee, um, what are your thoughts? Who do you want to see Tennessee play? Uh, where do you think they'll go? Who do you want to see Tennessee play? What is up to Daryl Jarrett? Glad you're here, my dude. Um, thank you for tuning in to the show. Let's see. I'm going to look up some other SEC football scores because now I'm curious um, of who all did what and everything, too, because uh, I don't know what I don't know what all the other SEC teams have done and how that's kind of played into what Tennessee um, what Tennessee should expect. All right. Let's see. Clemson, Trout, South Carolina. No surprise. Georgia destroyed Georgia Tech. Oh, my goodness. The uh, the Iron Bowl. I haven't talked about the Iron Bowl yet. <laughs> <laughs> what an ending to that game. And that game was fun. I was keeping up with, you know, watching both Tennessee basketball and Tennessee football play. I was keeping up with it as much as I could um, online and stuff. But that game was back and forth, back and forth. It seemed like whenever one team would score, the other would just instantly come back and score. The way that ended with, it was the most Butch Jones ending I've ever seen for Alabama football. And I, I love the fact that ever since Butch Jones has been in Alabama, they have yet to win you know, a, a national title. They, they have yet to really be what they want to be, yet to be the Alabama that they, they think they're capable of being. And they've also been injured quite a bit too. Just something about Butch Jones, man. He goes where he goes, just trouble follows him. Uh, but Auburn beats Alabama in the Iron Bowl, which that was, you know, Tennessee gets a win in football. Tennessee gets a win in basketball. You get to watch Auburn beat Alabama in the Iron Bowl. I don't know how... I, that, that's just a, a, a phenomenal day for Tennessee. Um, Tennessee's fans right there. Uh, don't know how much more you could ask for. Uh, let's see. Other scores. LSU is currently handing it to Texas A&M. Um, or, of course, you had the Mississippi State beating Ole Miss in the Egg Bowl because of the dumbest play of all time with the Ole Miss player pretending to be the, uh, the dog peeing on a hydrant. You have Missouri taking care of business against Arkansas on Friday. Um, that, that, you know, they're not going to be in bowl contention because of the NCAA being stupid. Kentucky beat the heck out of Louisville. I think that will be interesting to see. Louisville's a team I've seen Tennessee kind of get matched up with in bowl projections if it's not been um, the Gator Bowl. If it's been a, a bowl where Tennessee isn't being matched up with a Big Ten opponent 
I think Louisville will be a team that they've been matched up with some. So I, that will be interesting to kind of watch there too. Uh, and all the other scores I've just run through, um, South Carolina loses to go four and eight on there. I think I had before the season, I had Tennessee going seven and five, which I was right, but pff, um, not how I thought they would. And I think I had South Carolina five and seven. I don't, I might've had them going four and eight. I, I, I don't think so. I think I had them five and seven, maybe six and six, but I, I didn't have them doing very well. What a, what a disappointing season. For South Carolina, you've already got two job openings in the SEC. I wonder if you'll see a couple more. Gus Malzahn saved his job, um, that's for sure. Uh, so <laughs> uh, good for him, I guess. But get to the question here to Daryl Jarrett. Why did JJ go Super Saiyan on the sideline? Whew, oh, man, I don't know. Like I said, I, I just mentioned that earlier. I'm going to have to um, I'm going to have to go watch that happen again and see what will happen. Because I, I was watching it live. Uh, I was also trying to do some work. And of course, that's also when the SEC, you know, the SEC network alternate channel just decided to die and have the ear piercing just beep going on and on for a while there. And, and then the video cut out for a second. So that was awful. Uh, so I have to go back and watch that to see. But I, I don't know. I, it wasn't a good it wasn't a good decision by by Juwan at all. Um, so, I, I, I you know, I, like I said, that game was just very chippy and Vanderbilt and, and Tennessee both were just very much. Uh, all each other's grills in that entire game. So it, it, it had a feeling something like that might have was going to happen. I'm glad it didn't escalate into something worse uh, than what it could have been. Uh, Lane Pine says, I know it's the post game show, but after the Iron Bowl, how confident are you about Amari? I, I guess you're talking about Amari Thomas. I don't know. That's going to be interesting to, to see. I'm going to talk about the Vol recruiting, or certainly the VR2 guys. If y'all listen to the RTI and VR2 recruiting podcast, uh, you know what I'm talking about there. But uh, we do some partnership stuff with recruiting with VR2. Uh, those guys are awesome about covering Tennessee recruiting. But I'll talk to them afterwards. I do know just from seeing tweets and stuff, it looked like the Florida State commit and pass rusher Morgan Joseph really seemed to enjoy his trip to Tennessee. He's been tweeting out, I think, three different pictures of him in Tennessee gear. He changed his profile picture to him in Tennessee gear. He's a guy that Tennessee, their coaching staff really likes, Mormon Joseph. Let me go, let me go find his Twitter account because um, he hasn't committed, but he's a, uh, oh, he changed back his Twitter account, or his Twitter profile. He, he had it as a Tennessee picture and then he changed it back to him with a, I think a Joker mask actually, or of some, so, of some sort, but he uh, tweeted a picture of him and a teammate, I don't know whose teammate, or not a teammate, but him and someone else on a visit wearing Tennessee gear, and it said hashtag Vol with an orange, and then he, a tweet with him and a couple other guys, maybe his family, I'm not sure, but a few other guys in Tennessee gear with him, and then him just by himself, but the tweet saying, this is orange, don't say tangerine, because I'll get offended with an orange emoji and hashtag a GBO, so I, I, I think Morgan Joseph very much enjoyed his visit to Knoxville, um, Seems like Tennessee might be in a good spot. That, like I said, I'll, I'll talk with the VR two guys and kind of see uh, where Tennessee kind of stands with some of these guys. I'm sure they'll try to talk to some of them. This was a big weekend for uh, visitors for Tennessee. You had Lena Whitehead in town. You had Morgan Joseph in town. You had a receiver, a four star receiver from who's committed to Pittsburgh, whose name I'm blanking on, who uh, came in came into town as well. Uh, D Beckwith was in town for Tennessee. You had a couple of Tennessee commits were in town. I think Harrison Bailey made it back into Knoxville. Um, I want to say Jimmy Kelly was supposed to come in, but I'm not sure. But how do I think this game affected recruiting? I mean, it's only a positive. I mean, if if the way – well, I don't even know that was necessarily just this specific game, how it maybe affected Tennessee's recruiting. The only, the only maybe guy I think you could say would affect Tennessee's recruiting with, you know, were the guys that were on campus. And I think potentially – by the way, Tennessee used the tight end with uh, Dominic Wood Anderson, maybe a Darnell Washington. Um, he saw maybe what they've done with, with DWA here in the last few games, especially with the, the game he came and visited. They gave DWA the, the ball a few times, and, and Wood Anderson's been targeted a couple more times in the last couple weeks too. So I don't know if this specific game will help Tennessee in recruiting more so than just the way Tennessee finished this season. Their, their disaster start of the year cost them on some guys. It just did with, with the, you know, the Noah Sewell's, the Rakeem Jarrett's, um, the bride looks like they are Gilbert's too, but there's, but I think the way they were able to close, it, it helped them with some other guys like the Lineth Whiteheads, um, maybe like the Mari Thomases. I still think Tennessee is, is still very much in play with Jay Hardy. Obviously he's committed to Auburn, but I still think he's very much 
um, you know, in contact with Tennessee from everything we've heard. It helps them with the Octavius Oxendines. It helps them with a lot of guys who are still on their board. Maybe, you know, they're missing out on the Savelle Smalls and the uh, and some of those other top five-star kids. But I still think they're in it with five-star going out Washington. I still think they're in it with a lot of the high four-stars and then mid-tier four-stars are in, they're in after. So I think maybe not specifically just this game, but I think just the way Tennessee has ended uh, this season in general is is really helping them on the recruiting show. And I think you're still going to see Tennessee have, I think, a pretty good game or pretty good um, recruiting class overall. It may not be um, may not be what exactly Tennessee fans were hoping for, especially at the beginning of the year when you had a lot of momentum with those guys like Sabelle Smalls and Noah Sewell and whatnot. But um, I still think it's it's going to be a top 15 class. And I think you could be pushing for top 10, you're just going to have to have a lot go your way. You're going to have to be able to get Jay Hardy to flip back or flip over to Tennessee. You're going to have to get Amari Thomas. You're going to have to get Tyler Barron. You're going to have to get Lindeth Whitehead. Um, you're going to have to get Darnell Washington for that to happen. Even then, I think you still have to land a couple more um, high rate guys, like maybe an Octavius Ox and Dine. And I think Dylan Hyatt is going to shoot up recruiting rankings. He's going to be a bona fide uh, four star in the next recruiting update. Harrison Bailey could get uh, you know a, a bump as well. He, he was dropping down the rankings there for a bit. But it wouldn't surprise me to see Bailey hop back into the top 100 or close closer to it than what he is right now. Um, he's a top like 50 guy on rivals, I think, but on 247 he's not. So I, I think you could see him um, get a nice little boost with the way he's had a, a really good uh, senior season so far. He's 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 been killing. I'm trying to find his stats from um, last night. He was he threw for 185 yards and three touchdowns. So. Um, he didn't have to do a whole lot because they won 42 to 10. So, I mean, they, they mostly, I think, ran the ball a ton in that game um, for Harrison Bailey. But still, you know, three touchdowns, um, no interceptions, I think, for him in that game. So that's that's another strong performance by Harrison Bailey. Ethan Robbins says, well, John, uh, not Jonathan Johnson, goodness. Uh, John Jennings is going to have to wait till the bowl game to get over the thousand yard mark. Yeah, he got 50, was it 56 yards tonight, which let me go pull the stats really quick, put him over the 900 yard mark. Uh, but obviously, yes, as you said, he is not, he does not have 1000 on the season just yet. Let's see. He came into the game with 886. So that puts him right around 900 30 something, I think, on the season. So, yeah, he's going to get about 70 yards or so um, in Tennessee's bowl game to get that 1,000 yard mark. He'd be the first Tennessee wide receiver since 2012 to get 1,000 yards in a season. People, people like to say Josh Malone did it. He did not. Josh Malone got very close. You could technically count it, I guess, but he got like 907, 970 yards in 2016. Not quite 1,000. The last 1,000 yard receiver for Tennessee was Justin Hunter in 2012. I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I can double check that, but I'm almost fairly certain it's been um, since then that the balls have had in a thousand yard receiver. We're talking bowl games. I think we somehow got up on a completely different tangent there by recruiting there. We're talking about bowl games uh, for Tennessee just a little second ago. I want to see Tennessee and Michigan. I, I know that's people are saying, well, I want to, I want an easy victory for Tennessee. I want to see them play a, a team that they have a really good shot of winning. I think Tennessee can beat Michigan. I also just really want to see that game because that'd be two premier teams that we don't see very often play. They played one time ever and Tennessee trounced them, you know, in the Citrus Bowl in 2001. Was it after, it was after the 2001 season. It was technically in 2002, uh, I think on New Year's Day. But I, I really want to see, uh, I really want to see Tennessee play Michigan in a bowl game. Um, let's see. In a season, it's been since, I was right, 2012. It's been since 2012 that Tennessee's had a 1,000-yard receiver, Dustin Hunter, at 1,083. Um, also, the previous season, you had Dirk Rogers at 1,000 in 2011. You've only actually had eight balls or eight times, uh, seven different balls, eight different times uh, that Tennessee's actually had 1,000-yard receivers, um, period, which is weird to think about when you think that you know Tennessee used to be wide receiver U. It just also was a very different game back in the you know 80s and 90s, things like that. It wasn't as pass happy as you had it now. Uh, but, but you know that, that'll be it'll be a a, a great mark for uh, Jawan Jennings if you can get a thousand yards receiving um, on the year. 
Ethan Robbins again, what has happened to Chandler? Has he dinged up in a doghouse? I, I'm curious about that too. It, it, I don't know that he'd be in the doghouse. I just think they liked what Tim Jordan was giving them from a, a toughness yards perspective. Thad Chandler was having also some issues with holding on to the ball. He was fumbling. Um, it was like quite a bit, but he's been fumbling the ball and making poor decisions. You saw again today he made a bad decision on a on a uh, on a um, kickoff. That's what I can think of the word. He, on a kickoff where he called for a fair catch, but I, I don't think it actually – I think he had to catch the way he did. I don't know, but he, he, he's been – he's not been mentally checked out or anything like that. I, I do wonder now, though, with the way Eric Gray had that game today, with Tim Jordan coming back next season, with Colin Phils and B coming back next season, um, with Tennessee bringing in T. Hodge and, and looking for another running back to bring in in this class, does Ty Chandler – or maybe Tim Jordan – does someone out of Tennessee's running back room, do they move on after the season? Do they use this – You know, do they grad transfer to another program – after this year. I, I think that's going to be, you know, a lot of people are talking about the uh, quarterback room for next year and, and rightfully so, but that's going to be very interesting to watch. Um, but I, I almost wonder what happens with Tennessee's running back room, because I think you're going to see at least one guy transfer out, especially if Tennessee brings in uh, two backs in this class. You already have right now, as it stands, four scholarship guys returning with, you know, probably bring in T Hodge. And if you're bringing someone else, that's six guys you have there. I don't know that all of them stay. Um, I, I think at least one's going to go. Tennessee take, uh, talking about basketball, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, Teddy Earl Jarrett said, Coach Jeremy Pruitt said Chandler's ankle was tweaked and Greg got hot. Okay, so thank you. I, I missed that. I was, I was listening to the post-game interview, but I was also doing some work, um, so I missed that. So Chandler had a, a tweaked ankle uh, per Jeremy Pruitt, and he, and of course, Eric Gray was hot, so I, you know, I don't blame him for riding the Eric Gray train. I mean, it, it was... Uh, leaving station and not coming back tonight, so I, I don't blame that at all. Tennessee take. On the basketball note, the fact that a top 25 matchup had a janky stream was laughable. Turner somewhat made it for his bad game yesterday with the game winner. Yeah, let me talk about that that stream for a second because that was horrendous. I don't know how many of you guys got to watch the actual game. That was horrible. There was no actual play-by-play -play person. There was no actual, you know, call, there were no actual people calling the plays or calling the game or anything like that. They were just using a guy doing the, the PA system saying, you know, Jordan Bowden or Lamonte Turner. That was the only audio you had besides the actual game. Then half the time the game audio sounded like it was in a tin can or they just had the mistake of playing the break music, which was a generic cover of, uh, not bad to the bone. It was a generic cover of, of, of the song I'm blanking on now, but it, it was it was awful. I, I've, I've used to work and do play-by-play -play for um, high school football, South Dual football in, in East Tennessee for a company called Diamond Clear Media. They have a really good production team. They do a really good job of streaming the games and, and having good play-by-play uh, -play people. And they're not just me, but I, I thought I did a good job and have really good people do play-by-play -play and, and things like that for them. Really good production value uh, for what they do. They have higher production value and a better quality product than whatever the world Emerald Coast Classic was doing for the Tennessee VCU game today. I get that, you know, I don't know, that, that whole Emerald Coast Classic was just bizarre to me. You had that awful stream. You had the game played in a JUCO, um, you know, a JUCO gym that would hold like 2,300 people. It, it looked like it was a high school gym. It was that small, that kind of dingy. I don't know. It was awful. But, yes, Monte Turner did kind of redeem himself some of that game-winning shot. He didn't have a great game again today and up until that last shot. Um, he finished with 12 points, 7 assists, 5 rebounds, but he also had 5 turnovers and was only, I think, 5 of 14 from the floor, 2 of 5 from 3. But obviously, the, the, the second one was, was huge. Um, I'll talk some more basketball stuff here in a second. I'll, I'll kind of retweet the link out when uh, I'm going to talk specifically about some basketball. But thank you for that question. That, that, was, that was good bringing it up. Billy Bob says, JT Shrout. Will probably be transferring. Harrison Bailey will probably start next year. I don't. I don't know about that, Billy Bob. I don't know if. Um, I mean, JT Stroud. I think I agree with you. I think if you're going to have a quarterback transfer out of the the roster next year, I think it'll be him. I don't know that Harrison Bailey starts next year. Um, if if Garrett Tano does come back, um, like it, it seems like he was kind of leaning towards doing. I think he's starting again next year um, because I think ideally you'd like to have someone be able to start. You don't have to throw. Uh, Harrison Bailey as a true freshman into the fire, into the wolves um, to start as a true freshman in the SEC. You would ideally not like to have that. If maybe maybe if Garrett Tan doesn't come back or or whatever, maybe you can start Brian Mauer or start Kasim Hill, who's the the Maryland transfer. Maybe that's the case. But I don't I don't know that I would permanent marker in Harrison Bailey as Tennessee's starting quarterback for next season. 
Um, it could happen. I mean, I, I wouldn't be stunned if it happens at all. But I, I think it would be better if you give him time to develop as a redshirt year or whatever and just not have him have to start for you in his first year as a Vol. Um, I think it would be beneficial for everyone involved, not just him, but um, Tennessee's offense and just, just the team in general for what you're trying to do next season because Tennessee has a lot of positive momentum from this year they can build off of for next year. And you're losing some very key guys as seniors, obviously. Uh, Juwan Jennings, Dana Batuli, Darrell Taylor, Marcus Callaway. Um, you're probably going to be losing uh, Trey Smith to the NFL. I'd be stunned if he comes back to. But you seem like you, you have Brandon Kennedy potentially coming back as well, um, which that's going to be a big boost to Tennessee's offensive line. You, you've got other guys who are going to come back. Like I said, Carlin Phil's and me. We'll see what Baylor Buchanan can do. Um, I don't know if he'll be able to play again or not. But you have a lot of other guys who are younger this year who have been contributors. Who Roman Harrison's kind of showed some flashes. He obviously got his first career sack tonight. Obviously, Henry Toa Toa. Um, he, uh, he's going to be a – he should be a freshman All-American. If not a – I don't know that he'll be a regular All-American like this year, but he, he will be an All-American at some point. He, he should be All-SEC this season, that's for sure. Um, but he should be a freshman All-American. But um, you get a lot of key pieces returning next year that are, that are younger. But that, that, that'll be – to me, I kind of liken it to that uh, – the 2014 team that had a lot of young guys like the Jalen Hurds and the Derek Barnetts and the Josh Malones in, in that season, the 2015 season, if you had a competent coach, Tennessee would have, I mean, they would have been a, 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 a force to be reckoned with that year. I'm not predicting that for Tennessee next year, but I think the Oklahoma game might be a tad bit easier than what people were expecting. I still think Oklahoma wins that game, but that one's, I think, going to be a little more competitive than what people thought, especially early on this season. You get Florida at uh, home, which we'll see what happens there. I don't know. Alabama at home. I don't know. Alabama seems very uh, mortal right now. Uh, it will depend on what happens with their quarterback situation uh, next season. Next year, I don't, I'm not expecting anything huge. I'm not expecting 10-2, and two, probably 9-3. Nine and, nine and three. But, hey, 8-4 and four is not out of the question for next season for Tennessee. Um, I mean, 9-3 and three is not out of the question for next season. But that, that, that's we're getting way ahead of ourselves. So this season isn't even technically over with yet. Um, you still got a bowl game to go. Like I said, I would like to see Tennessee play Michigan. If they're not going to play, I, I don't like the Big Ten matchups because I just think, aside from Ohio State, most of the time, Big Ten football is pretty boring. Um, I'm trying to think of another team they use as an example. I mean, Wisconsin has a really good running back, or I think it's, yeah, they have a really good player. Um, but otherwise, most of the time, Big Ten football is just not very fun to watch. Um, Tennessee's last three bowl games have been against Big Ten opponents, and they've not been particularly close. I mean, I guess Nebraska is technically the closest one, and that one still Tennessee pretty much handled their business and didn't struggle a whole lot in that game. Uh, to me, if it's not going to be Michigan as a Big Ten team, I'd like to see Tennessee – I would like to see more just in general, more SEC bowl matchups with Big 12 and Pac-12 opponents just because – why not make bowl games fun and interesting? Why, why make it so tied regionally? I guess maybe because to sell tickets and to make sure that you're going to have, um, you know, fan bases that can travel to those games and it makes sense. But I would like to see at least just one or two more bowl gap, bowl matchups where it's not just SEC, SEC, ACC or SEC Big Ten. I like to see it's more SEC Pac-12 and SEC um, Big 12 matchups because I'd love to see a, a Tennessee-Texas bowl game. Uh, both those programs are seven and five. I think I, that would be a fun, fun, fun game to watch Tennessee and Texas play in a bowl game. As it is, I think you might end up seeing uh, Texas A&M and Texas in a bowl game because that would also be fun. But I, I would love to see both UTs play. I'd like to see Tennessee take on someone in the Pac-12. I mean, if they were better, they were not very good this year. But Washington State, just because I'd like to see Tennessee play Mike Leach, that'd be kind of fun to see, see, see Tennessee play at Washington or, or somebody. So. I would like to see more of that, um, but that's just – that doesn't happen a whole lot. I don't actually know if there's a SEC Pac-12 matchup off the top of my head unless it's one of the, uh, like, big-time year six bowls or anything like that. I don't know if there's a designated SEC Pac-12 bowl um, affiliation or not. But my dream matchup, like I said, is Tennessee-Michigan, if it's going to be a Big Ten especially. But I, I would like to see Tennessee-Michigan or Tennessee-Texas – uh, those are kind of my two dream matchups. If it's going to be ACC, I don't even know 
what all who all would be an option in the ACC. I guess the Louisville, but that would be Tennessee playing in like the Belk Bowl or something like that. I I I, I don't know that they'll go to the Belk Bowl. I'm pretty sure it's going to be the Gator or the Outback for Tennessee. If I had to bet on it, and you're hearing a lot about the Gator being you know the most likely one, and I I think that'll happen for for Tennessee. It, it wouldn't it wouldn't shock me if there's a different school that Tennessee ended up going to or different uh, bowl game, excuse me, that Tennessee would end up going to. Uh, but I, I do think it'll be a Florida Bowl. And I would be a little surprised if it was uh, something outside of Florida. If it was, like I said, if it was the Belk Bowl, if it was uh, the Texas Bowl. I don't think it'll be Music City. It will be Liberty. Um, so I don't think it'll be in state. It'll, I, I think it'll be Florida or somewhere around there. Someone mentioned, uh, Billy Bob said that Tyler Barron is going to commit to Tennessee. It'd be nice if he committed to Tennessee. Why is that the first thing that pops up when I search Tyler Barron? That is not at all what I was looking for. But I don't know if Tyler Barron was in Knoxville or not today. I think he was rumored to potentially be. But he's out here looking at his Twitter account. He's out here. Oh, I guess it's not from today. Okay, he didn't retweet anything today. Never mind. I uh, He did comment on Amari Thomas's tweet about when he's going to announce his commitment. You do have, by the way, you do have Amari Thomas committing um, later on, not this upcoming week, but the week after next, technically. Um, on Monday, December 9th, Amari Thomas will be announcing his commitment. Uh, someone asked earlier about how I feel about that. I, I still think Tennessee, but I'm going to talk with the VR2 guys and get back to you. Um, someone asked, I, no one asked earlier, I, I anticipate someone asking, no one did, you know, why didn't Eric Gray play more before tonight's game? You know, why have we not seen him play? I think Pruitt was asked that. He didn't really give – he didn't give a, a – I don't think he gave too much of a straightforward answer. I don't remember his exact words now when he was asked that question after the game. But I know for a fact from just things I'd heard and seen from, you know, games and, and people too that, I mean, he was having trouble pass blocking. Tennessee was, you know, passing more tonight. They didn't really pass the ball after the after the first seven pass attempts by Garantano. They, they stopped passing the ball a whole lot. So they brought him in to run because he was also, for one, he was showing off. And, and Vanderbilt has a really horrible run defense. So I think there's a couple of factors. You had the bad run defense. Um, Gray ripped off that big run to, to, to start, kind of get everything rolling in the first quarter there, and then he's rolled the hot hand. I, I think his biggest issue, why he hasn't played more, has been Tennessee's offensive line has not been great at run blocking this season. This was the this was definitely the exception. You've had, I think, maybe, maybe three games all year where I thought Tennessee had – really good run blocking from their offensive line. It was this game, um, Mississippi State, and BYU. So those are probably the only three games I would I would circle and say those were really good run blocking games by Tennessee's offensive line. Um, so that's, that's for one that Tennessee struggled to run block. Gray has been struggling to pass block. But I still think you could get him more touches. One of my biggest gripes with Jim Chaney, I've not had a ton because I thought Chaney's done a good job this season as Tennessee's OC. But my probably – my biggest gripe, I would say, would be not giving Eric Gray the ball a little bit more or Ty Chandler or someone, you know, not giving those backs that have a little bit more wiggle and explosiveness more touches and using the, the running backs in the passing game more. But also running backs have been pretty bad in the passing game. They've, they've dropped the ball a lot. They've fumbled the ball. They've just not done really well in the passing game. So maybe, you know, Jim Cheney probably knows a lot more than I do. Not probably. Jim Cheney does know a lot more than I do uh, about football. So, and specifically calling uh, the offense. So I'll keep going here, but thank you guys for tuning in here. I appreciate all of you who, who are watching along here. If you can give this video a like, that'd be fantastic. Um, uh, that'd be awesome. I'm not gonna try to sit here and beg for likes or anything like that, but if you can do that, that'd be awesome. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, that'd also be fantastic. I am Nathaniel Rutherford, the managing editor at rockytopinsider.com. Leave some more comments and questions. I'll, I'll be transitioning probably into some basketball talk here soon because Tennessee basketball had a, a great rebound today, but Tennessee football, talking about great rebounds and great bounce backs, one in four had a 5% chance of getting to a bowl game, and I think like a, a 0.6 or 0.7% chance, like a, it was like a 1% or less chance of getting seven victories on the season when they were one in four. I know for a fact when I was looking at teamrankings.com, which is a site I like to look at for a bunch of you know projections and things like that, they had Tennessee as a miracle finish at six and six. They didn't even have Tennessee at seven and five as a miracle finish. Just getting to six and six when Tennessee was one and four was considered a miracle finish for Tennessee by TeamRankings.com. Well, Tennessee performed a miracle, I guess, and, and more because they got to seven and five. The only loss in that stretch was to Alabama, 
that game could have been even closer than what the final score indicated, if not for the obvious most disastrous play I've ever seen in Tennessee history. Well, I don't know about that. That's a that's an interesting topic for another day of the most disastrous plays in Tennessee history because you could throw in the 13 minute on the field against LSU, you could throw in, uh, there's a lot, the, the fourth and whatever it was against Florida in 2015. I don't want to go down those rabbit holes, but aside from that game, Tennessee's won every other game they've played since starting one and four. And it's not like they've been against a bunch of cupcakes. Mississippi State's a, a you know a, a decent team. Mississippi State's probably on the same level as Tennessee for the most part, and Tennessee won that game. They, they won games that were toss-up games, is my point. They didn't win games that, you know, they were favored by a touchdown or more, except for, you know, obviously tonight against Vanderbilt. Tennessee was underdogs except for UAB in every other game they've played except for tonight. The only two games Tennessee's been favored in um, – down the stretch here was UAB and Vanderbilt. Every other game, they were underdogs, and they won all but one of them, and that was against Alabama. They beat Mississippi State by 10. They beat South Carolina by 20. Uh, they beat Kentucky by 4. They beat Missouri by 4. And there were there were road underdogs about those games. I don't know when the last time was Tennessee won two SEC road games as underdogs. Because I know in 2015, they won two road games in the SEC, but they weren't underdogs in both those games. Um, that year, they won road games against... Um, Kentucky and I think Missouri too. Yeah, that would have been 2015. So those those two would have been road games then too. So they weren't they weren't underdogs in those games. They they might have been against Missouri. I don't remember what Missouri how good they were. Um, but they weren't against Kentucky that game. That's for sure. Um, so I don't know when the last time was Tennessee won two SEC road games as underdogs in a season. So I'm, you know this isn't the 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 best season ever. Obviously this isn't to you know I'm not trying to pump this up more than what it is. It was. It's still highly impressive to me that Tennessee has been able to have this turnaround with this season, with the way it began, with all these seniors taking fire. You know, I, I mentioned. I remember in a, in a, I think in a post game show. It was. If it wasn't a post game show, it was with Ben McKee on an RTI podcast where I, I mentioned. I thought Tennessee had better seniors, a better you know, a better core of, of leaders last year than they, they did this year. Better upperclassmen last year than this year. These upperclassmen responded exceptionally well to criticism, you know, not just obviously for me. I, I don't think I was a particularly harsh critic of before what you saw from a bunch of other people, not just, you know, not just locally, but nationally especially. But they responded so well to all the harsh criticisms you had um, from the media, from, you know, probably from within, uh, from the fan base as well. I think this senior class was probably the most impressive part of, of Tennessee's season. Maybe Jared Garantano coming back and, and putting together, you know, a better finish to his season than what it started. But I think guys like Jawan Jennings, Nigel Warrior especially, Nigel Warrior has been the most impressive turnaround for me this season, you know, just individually. But they did Batuli, Drill uh, Taylor. Um, I guess technically Trey Smith, even though he's not a senior. But those guys, all those guys I just mentioned, Marcos Callaway as well. Brandon Kennedy is a senior too. But he hasn't been, I guess he hasn't been here as long as these other guys have. They all took all of that personally, put that on their backs. And I wrote a, an article uh, Friday morning about how the seniors to me are the, were the biggest key and biggest reason why Tennessee's season got saved and, and why they were able to turn this thing around. Um, they deserve a lot of credit. And they, I think they get a lot of credit. Uh, no one special. Welcome to the show. No one special. Let's be real, Jarrett's inability to throw screen passes has hurt the running backs in the passing game. That's why Gray hasn't used that much until today. He'd be an excellent third down back. I do agree with that. I think the screen plays have been on both, you know, Jarrett or slash the Tennessee's quarterbacks and the running backs' fault both. Running backs have either dropped too deep or not deep enough when they were supposed to be running those routes and also just the throws on out to the swing to the side there, uh, you know, mostly by Garantano and just been, have been inaccurate. So for whatever reason, Tennessee just – uh, they can't execute a they can't execute a freaking screen pass to save their lives. But I'm going to transition now to some basketball talk. Um, so if you're not into that, I'm sorry. But I'm going to transition into some basketball talk on the post game show for the last 15 20 minutes here or so. Let's talk about Tennessee basketball. They go down Friday night and just play awful against Florida State. You have 21, I think 21 turnovers. I don't think it was 23, but it's upwards of 20 turnovers 
against Florida State. Still somehow only lose by three. I know obviously that's kind of boosted by that last second three um, in that game. But you go out, you play horribly, you still only lose by, you know, by, by, by most you were lose by two possessions in that game. It had to be, it was obviously a discouraging loss, but also had to be encouraging that, hey, you played awful and still somehow almost came away with a victory um, against a, a, you know, really good team as far as what, what they have talent-wise, athleticism and the length they have down low and the height they had down low. They had two seven-footers, uh, I think a couple six-foot-nine guys who were bringing in a lot of um, pressure to Tennessee as well. So bounce back tonight with against a really good VCU squad who, I mean, they played they did, they played poorly against Purdue. Both, both Tennessee and, and VCU had really bad games in their first game of the Emerald Coast Classic. Uh, VCU turned the ball over 21 times against Purdue as well. Uh, so they did the same thing Tennessee did and lost by three to Purdue. Tennessee comes out, didn't play great again today, um, but they were able to get past those mistakes. John Ferguson, people are obviously going to talk about the Monte Turner three, and as they should, that was a phenomenal um, play by him and, and the game winner. That's just that's going to get all the attention in it. Like I said, rightfully should. To me though, the real the real kind of sneaky big difference um, in this game against VCU was John Fulkerson. He was he had two points and two rebounds against um, FSU on a Friday. Against VCU today, he totaled a career high seventeen points. He grabbed seven rebounds. He was um, very efficient from the floor. I think he's like 7 of 10 or something like that from the floor. Not 7 of 10. I mean, I, I, have, I don't have the stats right in front of me. Uh, let me get those really quick. But to me, Fulkerson was was the biggest difference. He played a lot different and a lot better than he did against FSU. He was he was 7 of 10. He was 7 of 10 from the floor, 3 of 4 from the free throw line, 7 rebounds and assist, only one turnover, only three personal fouls in 26 minutes. So he, he was kind of, to me, a, a huge difference in this game. Turner didn't have a great game, like I said, up until that last three. Five of 14, two of five from three, seven assists, five rebounds and 12 points, but five turnovers in the game. But that, that obviously, that last three was what kind of the most. Santos Silva for VCU was single-handedly bringing them back in this game. 22 points, 11 boards for him, and he had a phenomenal performance. Jenkins also had a good game with 15 points um, for VCU. Got worried they're watching it. It was about the time when Tennessee footballs, their, their football team had started to turn things around and were starting to play better. Tennessee's basketball team started playing worse, and they had a, an early 13-point lead very early in the second half, a 10-point lead a little bit later on. That got erased, and VCU grabbed a two-point lead. It was originally a three-point lead, but then they, uh, they knocked off a point because it, they, they ruled it not a three, they ruled it a two instead. Um, they took the lead back briefly, and then they, Tennessee got it back, VCU got it back again, and then, TC, or then Tennessee got it back, but they can never get ahead of more than three points. And then you had um, you had that three by Jenkins with about four seconds, lower four seconds to go. Tennessee races past half court, calls a timeout. They, they originally had 1.1 seconds. They add on a, another six tenths, which that was huge. With 1.7 seconds to go, inbounds it. Tennessee jacks it up the three. Turner hits it. Game over. If you haven't seen the video, check it out. It's on Rocky Top Insider on Twitter, and we also have it on our Instagram page as well. Um, so that was a phenomenal ending. To me, th- this was what you wanted after the way Tennessee played against FSU. This was the kind of bounce back victory you wanted. A lot of ball fans I saw were, for whatever reason, very doom and gloom and sky is falling after that game against Florida State. I I, I don't know why. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say a lot, I guess, but there were there were enough fans kind of freaking out over that that loss when it was the first loss of the season for Tennessee. I, I didn't understand why people were so upset over it. Tennessee played really bad. They had 20 plus turnovers, got out just destroyed in the paint. Fulkerson was not was not doing anything at all. I, I get it. Teams that have a lot of length and size are going to give Tennessee issue, but I don't think there are many teams on Tennessee's schedule who have the type of length and size and athleticism that FSU has. They have two seven footers, at least one other guy um, who was six foot nine. I'm, I'm going to check out their roster really quick because I think they had at least uh, two seven footers and at least another, if not two six foot nine guys. I, I don't think Tennessee. There aren't that many guys or any teams on the on their their schedule. Okay, yeah, they had. A seven foot one, a seven foot, a six foot nine, and a six foot eight, and actually two other six foot eight guys um, who who play some as well. They're they're a fairly deep team. They're a team that's going to cause a lot of trouble um, down the stretch. I, I think they're going to be a, an interesting team to 
watch as the season goes on. Let me see what they uh what did they do against Purdue. They beat Purdue. So yeah, there you go. They're 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 uh <laughs> I think Florida State's going to be a team that's they're going to be in the top 25 now when the new poll comes out. Um, I think they're a good team. I think they are. Uh, a couple things here on the chat. Lane Pine says, until Lamonte gets his shot back, he should focus on getting others the ball. I agree. He's been making some really bad passes, um, especially obviously against Florida State. But I, I think you're right there, Lane. I 100% agree. I think he, until he can, I don't know if he's ever going to really get his shot back the way you would want because that shoulder is still bothering him. Um, and that's unfortunate because I was hoping he would be able to be healthy for his, you know, his last season at Tennessee. But unfortunately, that's just not been the case for him. Bowden also didn't have a great game today. The, the senior guard duo didn't have a great game. Bowden just didn't shoot a whole lot. He started off the game, you know, shooting, and then he had a couple quick baskets for Tennessee. But he only shot the ball six times today. He was six of six from the free throw line, which was huge. Tennessee was 15 of 16 from the free throw line, which I didn't even mention in my uh, three observations piece after the game. But that's huge. 15 of 16. Um, now I'm not skipping your question. Sorry, I, I saw your question. I'm just talking basketball. Right now I'll, I'll go back to your question about Jennings here in a second uh, when I get to more some f- football talk. I'm just talking basketball right now. Um, I'll get to it. Wasn't skipping it. Sorry. Um, but Tennessee, 15 to 16 from the free throw line. That was huge. They out rebounded VCU through 7-28. They had 12 assists to VCU's 10. The, the thing I said, Tennessee, 13 turnovers, and VCU had five. I mean, that Tennessee didn't play great but they're able to be better in this game and overcome their mistakes better. Um, I will actually go ahead and Christos, I will get to your question here. Um, do you guys think Jawan Jennings stepping on the guy's head was intentional? I don't know. I, I'm going to have to go back and rewatch that. Like I mentioned earlier, from what I saw on Twitter, what people are saying, they didn't think it was intentional. They thought he was not looking down. But I love that. The one, no one special here says it looked like Hainsworth. And I saw a couple other people say he, he did the Hainsworth there. So I, I'm going to have to go back and see it and watch the video of it because I, I, I did not catch it in real time because the video audio was messing up so badly on um, the SEC alternate channel at that point that I, I don't know. But I'm sure someone's got a video of it out there uh, on Twitter. I can go find and, and see it and uh, watch it. But I was also trying to do some work, um, you know, writing up the post game stuff for um, the game while that was happening. So. I'll have to go back and watch. Um, let me let me let me let me see if I can find that really quick to watch it kind of in real time. I don't know if I'll be able to or not. Uh, yeah, here we go. Found it right here. All right, let's see. He's chasing him down, chasing him down. Boom! Plows him out of bounds. Oh, they uh, cut before it shows him get up. Well, that's not a good video. They cut before it shows them getting up. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I'm trying to find it for you, so I can kind of watch it and, and see what happened there at the end. I really thought. I really thought I saw someone tweet it earlier. Maybe not though. I'm gonna check and see. Uh, I think Trey Wallace usually has that stuff, so I'm gonna check and see. You know, Trey Wallace is a, a good a friend of mine. Um, he usually has good videos and stuff. So let me see if he has it. Mm, nope, don't see it. Oh, well, I'm sure I will find it later and watch it for you guys. And I'll, I'll share my thoughts on Twitter. So if you want to follow me, it's at Mr. Underscore Rutherford. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'll, I'll watch it and share my thoughts on there as well. But see, Kevin, Kelvin Lewis on here on the, on the chat saying it wasn't intentional. He was looking the other way. I don't know. I've seen it. I've seen everyone say everything else differently. I, like even here in the chat, the couple people saying it looked intentional and now saying it doesn't. So I've seen, I've seen both sides of it on online of people saying it looked intentional people saying it didn't look intentional so i don't know i'm gonna have to go back and watch it and and let you know later um without, without having it fresh in my mind i don't know um which is unfortunate i mean it's it's still whatever happened it's not a good look for him you know or the university I, I, he shouldn't have done it um if, if he stepped on the guy's face mask and it, or on the guy's head and it was unintentional he didn't notice it that's one thing just the whole white hit and everything there it just wasn't a good look for juan um, I don't condone it at all, but I've not seen it um, to go back and, and watch it. I only, like I said, the only play I could find on Twitter just now doing a, a cursory search for it. Um, did not produce any results that um, were satisfactory that, that, that showed the actual. Here you go. Hold on a second. This might be it. 
Let's see. Here's Jennings getting pulled up. I, mmm. I don't know. I don't know that you can definitively say either way there that that was intentional or not. He, he stomped, yes, but he also was kind of just being demonstrative and, and trying to get up and kind of go away. He had his face mask. His head was turned completely the opposite direction of where he was stepping. I don't know that it was intentional. It didn't look good, but I, I don't think it was intentional by Juwan there. I, 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 mm. it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't look great, but I, I'm going to hold off and say that he uh, did that on purpose. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, and that's obviously – probably me with my Tennessee bias covering the team and everything here and then, you know, trying to be biased probably towards Juwan. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe just big orange glasses or whatever you want to call it. Maybe I'm wrong. If, if it comes out, he did that intentionally or whatever, that sucks. And he, he should be punished for it. But I don't think it was intentional. It looked like to me, it was a matter of him trying to get up and trying to move away. And it doesn't look good, but I don't think he did it intentionally. I don't think he did. I don't know. It, it's 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 difficult to say. And maybe I'm being wishy-washy. Maybe you're gonna call me a politician for not taking a side here. But I I don't think it was intentional. It doesn't. Like I said, it's not good either way. Um, I understand Manuel fans being upset with it, but I don't think it was intentional. But I think I'm gonna go ahead and end the show here. It's been over an hour. I got a couple more things I want to do for uh, wrapping up stuff for Tennessee for this game, and we have we'll have more videos and stuff here on the channel Rocket Top Insider on YouTube of um and it's i mean it's fair christos you know we're the next steps landing at all times I, I i mean i don't know i like him too i'm not gonna try to make excuses for him i just for watching the video i don't personally think it was intentional but i understand anyone who took it that way and like i said especially the bandy fans who are upset about it i understand that 100 it doesn't look good regardless um i'm not gonna tell anybody they're wrong for thinking it was it was intentional because it looks like it it's it's too borderline to me to know He's not going to – I don't know that we'll hear from him about it. I don't know if we'll hear from Tennessee about it or not, but um, we'll see. But I, I, it, I don't blame anyone for being upset about it. But we'll have more videos here on Rocket Top Insider on YouTube, uh, post-game celebrations from, from the players, uh, post-game video from the players uh, talking to the media and stuff. We've got Jeremy Pruitt's post-game presser on our Periscope on Twitter, and Periscope, you find us there as well. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, obviously YouTube, and Rocket Top Insider on all of those. I'm at Mr. Underscore Rutherford on Twitter. Uh, so thank you all so much. Kevin, I, I talked about Amari Thomas earlier. If you want to go back when this gets done and watch the replay of this, it was probably after the – man, I don't remember. It was probably in the 20-something minute mark when I, when I started talking about recruiting a little bit more, um, between the 20, 20, 30 minute mark. But Amari Thomas, I, I will be interested to see what happens with him there. But I do thank all of you who tuned in tonight and, and left comments and interacted and everything. Thank you all so much. Give this video a like. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Uh, you guys are awesome. This is the last football post-game show of the regular season. We'll do one after the bowl game, that's for sure. And I will definitely be doing some for basketball season this year. Um, probably not until the Memphis game. That's going to be a huge one. Um, thank you, Kevin. And yes, Lane, we will do a recruiting podcast next week. Um, we'll have at least one. We'll try to do two if we can. This week didn't work out because it was Thanksgiving and illness and everything, too. Um, so to me... I would like to do two recruiting podcasts this week, but we'll see. But thank you all so much. Like I said, I am Nathaniel Rutherford, the managing editor of RocketTopInsider.com. I appreciate all of you who tuned in tonight, all of you who commented, all of you if you shared this video or anything like that. Thank you so much. If you missed any of it, this will be archived almost immediately after it gets done being live. And also I have it posted on RocketTopInsider.com embedded in an article, either later tonight or first thing tomorrow morning. Thank you all for tuning in to the RTI Post Game Show. We'll see you again probably after December 14th, after the Memphis basketball game. Talk to you guys later.